Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft departed the asteroid Ryugu back in November of last year, but we are still having data coming back from the various instruments and landers that the spacecraft dropped on it. And finally, a couple of weeks ago, they finally released the imagery from the small carry-on impactor experiment. That is, where they attempt to shoot an asteroid with an anti-tank weapon. Okay, I may be stretching the definition of weapon here, but this was a small spacecraft called the Small Carry-On Impactor, which used a shape charge to propel a 2 kilogram copper plate at the asteroid at a speed of about 2 kilometers per second. So I don't want you to think that this is like the video game Asteroids, where they were expecting the asteroid to fall apart. No, this asteroid was 450 million tons. This created a small crater in the side of it. The, mo the biggest danger was actually to the spacecraft itself, which dropped off a camera called a deployable camera that was able to view the event, while the spacecraft moved around the other side of the asteroid, performing what they call a hazard avoidance maneuver, or as I like to say, a GTFO maneuver. The deployable camera was about the size of a small cup and it would be spin stabilized, had its own power source. It would view the thing and then transmit the images back to the spacecraft, which would then get forwarded to Earth. And we had six images off the plume. They were even able to observe the munition sitting in space prior to activation, so they could actually figure out the trajectory very accurately. So here we have the six images all reframed and recalibrated so that we are getting roughly the same dimensions and geometry. You'll notice that as the time goes on, the source or the point of the crater seems to move down across the asteroid. That's because the asteroid is, is rotating relative to the target. It's of course a lot easier to see this when you convert it to a movie. You can see the plume growing and the asteroid rotating towards us. Now, one important thing to see is that the ejecta appears to go off uh, in one direction rather than the other. This is because the impact is happening in a medium which isn't just small, uniform-sized grains of rock, pebbles or whatever. There are boulders in there which will you know, retransmit the energy in different ways. There are boulders that were visible on the surface, and those boulders presumably extended down below the surface. And so those wouldn't adju just adjust the way that uh, the ejector flowed away from the surface, but also the way that the energy was transmitted under the surface of the asteroid. Asteroid. And this distribution of gravel and boulders is much more obvious when you look at the site you know, before and after the impact. You can see that the after image has the site looking much darker because they've excavated material which is underneath the surface that has been protected from solar radiation. This was of course a big part of the mission. They wanted to expose pristine material so that they could sample it and bring it back to Earth for analysis. But equally, the dynamics of the cratering are just as interesting. When we look at surfaces in the solar system, one of the ways we estimate the ages is by looking at the distribution of craters. Now, asteroids are completely different cratering surfaces than, say, the moon. If we go back to the sequence showing the conical ejecta plume, then you'll notice that it goes all the way down to the crater and it stays attached to the crater all the way through the system. And this is important because if it became detached, that would indicate that the strength of the rocks, the strength of the material, was finally holding the ejecta back rather than gravity holding the ejecta back. So what this tells us is that the asteroid is very, very weak. So this gravel and the regolith isn't held together in any way. It's not being glued together by organic compounds or solar radiation or anything. It's just sitting there and when it was hit, it just flew off. It's also possible to analyze the non-uniformity of ejecta and see rays that are formed. These rays are formed because of you know, blocks of more solid material getting in the way. So by analyzing the plume and then looking at the crater before and afterwards, they were able to identify specific boulders that were just stopping the debris heading in that direction. So you could figure out how massive those boulders were, how much they were kicked around by the energy of the event. You can also look at the detailed topography of the crater. This is, of course, Im you know, created from images, stereoscopic images, uh, and you see the differences in the height. The crater only goes down a couple of meters, and it's about seven meters in radius. So a couple of kilograms of copper managed to blow several tons of regolith off, and much of it would have ended up in deep space. 
But this crater experiment also helps us understand the age of Ryugu. Now that we know when you hit it, how big a hole it makes, well, there were some estimates that were placed in the surface of Ryugu at, you know, 100 million years. But the surface is a lot weaker than that model suggests. So the surface might only be maybe 9 mil 10 million years old. The first, the top meter of Ryugu's surface probably gets completely turned over by small impacts every 100,000 years or so. I also like the fact that the team came up with names for everything. So we have the crater is Omosubi Kororan Crater, which is the SCI crater. We have the moved boulder or Ijima boulder, Okamoto boulder, a mobile rock, or Onigiri boulder, large boulder. So it's almost like a lesson in Japanese, isn't it? And after they took a sample of the site in July, they called the second touchdown point Ushidi no Kuzuchi, right? Which has an interest, a magic hammer that can produce great riches. I like that. Yeah, as I mentioned, this whole crater experiment was largely so that they could make a hole in the asteroid and get deep beneath reg the regolith and find less processed material, which would perhaps provide different results from the first sample site. So this is the sample movie. Obviously, it's running a lot faster than in real time. As the horn gets down and touches the surface, it fires a small tantalum bullet into the surface, and that, of course, kicks up a bunch of debris, which makes it way inside the collection horn and the spacecraft performs its maneuver to get the heck out of there. There's also still uh, images coming back from the very surface of Ryugu. Uh, if you remember, Hayabusa carried with it several other spacecraft that it dropped on the surface. One of those was Mascot. It was a German-built spacecraft. You could think of it as a rover, but it's more like a hopper. This is the trajectory it followed here, very carefully laid out. It fell down and it hit this rock at CP1, bounced and landed at uh, SP1, and then sort of used its onboard reaction wheel kicker type thing to take a few steps across the surface of Ryugu. And while it didn't have amazing cameras, it was on the surface, so it was able to get images at millimeter scale resolution in some cases. They were also able to spend time in certain locations and uh, use their wheel filter wheels. So we have a lot of images coming back. This is a sequence of various images showing it sort of tumbling towards the surface and different views of what it looks like. Again, you can see that there are things that look like boulders, a lot of stuff that looks like gravel. It looks now that those boulders are actually very porous, that they have a lot of uh, void space in them, and that means that their thermal inertia is not the same as regular rocks. If you remember my interview with Dante Loretta, this was a big surprise. They thought they were going to a sandy beach of an asteroid, when in fact the rocks just happen to have thermal properties similar to a sandy beach. From the surface, when they were able to sit still, they could flip the filter wheel around and get color images off the surface. And that meant they could actually do comparative mineralogy. They could look at inclusions in these rocks, identify different colors, uh, even look at the spectral properties or get broad spectral property guesses and try to figure out what kind of minerals they were actually seeing at the granular level on the surface of this rock in space. And Mascot wasn't the only spacecraft sent to the surface. There was also Minerva, a rover 1A and 1B. Those had actually been sent earlier. And as Ryugu moved closer to the sun, apparently they woke up from hibernation. There might be some new operational data coming from those. But also, after the crater uh, event, they had another Minerva that they were going to land on the surface. I haven't actually seen any updates on this, but I'd be really curious to see if we got more photographs or images from these. There was a third Minerva. It was going to be larger and heavier. Uh, unfortunately, it sounds like it failed. It had a hardware failure even before they planned to deploy it. So the original deployment plan would have put it on the surface. Instead, well, they had to get rid of it because they didn't want to carry the extra mass with them. After all, Delta V is critical. So they released it and then spent time observing it because they wanted to do gravitational measurements, I guess. 
But that does mean we get this kind of cool image of it floating in space. The other thing we got to see, which I thought was cool, was the targeting markers they used. They would drop these things, uh, attempting to put them close to the target, and then the navigation system would use them. So uh, this is just like a stack of images showing the navigation marker as it moves off towards the asteroid. The spacecraft actually included a camera flash so it could take images like this, which is not something you usually see on a spacecraft given that they're usually millions of miles away from the things they're photographing. Anyway, Hayabusa is on its way home. We're expecting to have it land at the end of the year. And of course, we'll continue to get new scientific output from it uh, over that time. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.